Uh, we are Project Nine. That should be the name of our band, really, shouldn't it? Um, my name is Gav Cole. I'm from the University College Birmingham. Uh, my colleague Carmina from there we go. And Kirsty, who you saw in the video earlier. Yeah. <laughs> A celebrity already, wonderful. Uh, so the idea is we're going to present uh, some of our findings from the research that we've been doing under uh, quite a broad title of developing new teaching strategies for improving English. Um, I think there'll be uh, hopefully some tenets, some outcomes that might be helpful to yourselves. Um, I'd like to start just by saying what a useful process this has been for myself and my colleagues and my students. And we all know being engaged in this activity has been one of those things you've tried to balance with the 50,000 emails, the staff going off sick, the, you know, uh, oh, you're being observed tomorrow, oh, brilliant, <laughs> wonderful. Um, but actually, it's been a really, really positive experience, um, certainly from my perspective. So I'm going to sort of set the scene, hopefully, I don't know how coherently, but I'll try. Uh, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues uh, who are going to tell you a little bit about what they uh, did in their institutions and the major outcomes. Um, and then I will do the same for my own institution. So let's see if the next slide. Oh, look, there we go, that seemed to work. Ooh, hours spent on that. Uh, here we go. <laughs> so, um, just to give you a sort of general idea, our three institutions are very different. When we talk about um, further education, it's not homogenous. You know, we, we all have uh, very different institutions, and yet the conversations that we've been able to have often centre around not only the same strategic challenges that we have, but also the challenges that we see in our classrooms. Just talking to Kirsty about what she was saying on that video, my students face the same challenges, my staff and myself face the same challenges, and adopting this kind of action research stance has been really useful in trying to find a coherent way to, to kind of address some of those challenges and highlight the opportunities for our learners. So, use um, of the University College of Birmingham, uh, or UCB for short, check it out. Uh, we were looking at GCSE research students in an FE context, we're also an HE provider, and the use of darts activities, which you know, be of no surprise to you, working collaboratively with sport. Um, then, a Moulton, land-based college, uh, looking again looking at GCSE um, resits and how to scaffold responses to reading questions. And actually we found that our projects really kind of meshed, and I hope that comes out today, and finally Harminder's project looking at ESOL. So very diverse, and yet some of the themes that came out are quite obvious. Um, so just to give you a very, very brief bit of context, our projects were all situated, despite our different institutions, in the kind of things that I suspect are common to all of you. Um, concerns about the average reading age in this country, regardless if we're looking at pre-16, post-16. Um, the, the reformation of both GCSEs and hot on the heels uh, functional skills. Dancing on a shifting rug, as I would call it. Mm -hmm. And the, the rigour of the new EF. Um, I've just come out with some deep dives. and which is why I probably look a bit sort of frazzled, and how the EF is really focused on the development of literacy skills across programmes of study. Hopefully what will come out today is that there's some key sort of thematic strands. The sharing of pedagogy, not just strategy, but pedagogy across departmental boundaries. Really trying to foster meaningful collaboration. Um, it's something that, that comes up a lot when we're writing proposals and we're in management meetings, but actually making collaboration meaningful um, such that it empowers colleagues. Um, the notion of developing shared strategies in the classroom, not just these kind of strategies institutionally, but in the classroom, um, and shared resources, professional dialogue, etc. And the notion of focusing on skills development uh, not just hitting assessment criteria, something that came out of all three projects. Um, and Claire would be happy for me to say this, the, the, the value in adopting this action research stance, I, I found it personally really kind of liberating uh, in my classroom practice. And all of the projects that we're going to present today really put the learner at the centre. And that might be our picture. Great. 
But putting the learner at the centre by really looking at what they individually need in terms of their skills development and their confidence and finding the right strategies and getting everyone to use those right strategies. Uh, all those impactful or influencing strategies perhaps. Um, and the impact that has on learner confidence, which again came out of one of the videos that we saw earlier. So without further ado, and no more gilding of the uh, leaf, I'm going to focus on you. So I'm going to shuffle into the corner. Hi everyone. My name is Harmindra, I'm from Samuel College. And the project that I did with staff at the college was around developing learners' ESOL spellings. And the project, what we wanted to achieve from the project was to improve spelling skills, especially at the lower levels, because the staff that I worked with, um, two of the members of staff had pre-entry learners, and one member of staff had an entry one class, so it wasn't your entry three level one learners, it was your lower level learners. Um, also to develop staff awareness of effectiveness of, of a range of approaches, um, giving staff the confidence to use something different, take that risk, um, which all staff from the feedback, they all, that was one of the main things that staff said, they wanted that opportunity and they were able to have, get that opportunity of doing that. And also to increase learners' motivation and ability to see their own progress. Um, with ESOL learners, they always, they seem to say, if it was a speaking and listening, if speaking and listening, if it's their reading or their writing, they always feel, because English isn't their first language, they're not always that good, but showing them the progress that they can make over a short period of time. Being ESOL, I have to put pictures in, um, because for me, that's how ESOL learners read them. It's very visual. So the first picture is, with at Samuel College, for writing across all levels, the success rates are pretty high, we're at 96%. However, learners, when it comes to their individual learning plans and their individual targets, it's always, Miss, can I practice my spellings? I always, it's always spellings. So as a team, um, we all met together and shared our thoughts about what we thought would be the best project to go and what route to take. And all the staff thought, well, spellings, if learners are always asking for them. With the, lear the learners that were part of the project, um, they come from countries such as Iraq, Iran, Gambia, Eritrea and Albania. That's where most of our learners are from. And in the pre-entry classes, these learners, they might have had, might have had access to education in their countries, however, they haven't had access to English education. And with a lot of learners, when we ask them about a spelling strategy, they just thought, you learn spellings by, just keep writing them in a line one after the other, one after the other, just to practice them. Um, three members of staff were part of the project, and each member of staff worked, um, carried out the project with one of their groups, and that group consisted of 20 to 25. 20 to 25 learners in each group. One member of staff used the approach of giving learners words, but cutting up the actual letters. So learners had to then put the letters together in, to spell the word. The first member of staff, she chose to get learners to practice the months of the year, because they're not only needed for ESOL, they're, all, they're English, they're also needed for their entry one maths. Um, and then she progressed on to getting learners to learn the spelling of their address in exactly the same way. The second member of staff, she decided on giving learners standalone words for topics that were being covered um, throughout the nine weeks that we um, carried the project out for. And the little bee in the middle, is both of these members of staff wanted to do like a spelling bee kind of competition with the learners and get given the confidence to pronounce letters correctly, not only writing them but also get them to verbally pronounce them as well. However, the most successful project was the member of staff who used a word board. The member of staff actually started off by giving learners sentences, but the words were all cut up individually. And learners had to put the um, words into the correct order to be able to spell the whole sentence and not just the word. Not just the word. Um, because it was becoming a bit time consuming, the member of staff decided to use a word board. And the word boards, 
started off with the first five sentences, as you can see on this side, and each week it progressed by an additional sentence being added onto the word board. So by the end of the project, these are all the sentences that learners were given. And what the learners actually did was, they, with, with these sentences, they were able to then relate those sentences to themselves. So when it came to writing about their own personal details, they could use these sentences. And when, even in one of their maths lessons, they had to talk, they were doing the topic of money and about going shopping, and they were going to create a character. And that whole group said to their maths teacher, his name is Tim. He lives, he's 16 years old. He lives in London. He, uh, he comes from London, he lives in Birmingham, he studies at Samuel College. So they actually use that character not only in their ESOL, but move that character to their maths class as well. So, little activity for you. I'm going to give you one minute to practice the spelling of three words. You will need to use the look, co copy, cover, write, check method to practice the spellings. And in each of the, uh, on the yellow envelope on your table, you will find your word board and you will find a pink card to use to cover your spellings. So when I say go, you will have one minute to practice the spellings and we'll have a spelling test at the end. In one minute, starts now. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's one minute. Oh no. Are you ready for your spelling test? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody need one more minute? <laughs> <laughs> need a life. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to give you a spelling test. Um, this, this was just my way of showing you what the word board is. Um, I chose words which were really long because for ESOL learners, just having the word Birmingham or just having the word study might be too long for them. So it's my way of showing you how the word board was used. So the sentence was given to a learner instead of a standalone word. So the, the sentence became relevant. And having the pink card to cover up the spellings gives you that cover. You might, looking at this, it says look, copy, cover, write, check. We, the ESOL tutor who used this method took out the word say because not all learners at the pre-entry level were confident in reading the words. And them reading the word incorrectly meant they would be hearing it incorrectly, which could then mean that their spelling may not have been correct. They may have, may have read the word in a different way to hear a different letter. And with this activity, taking out the word say, um, I can't say any of those words, so if anybody <laughs> wants to keep it at all, please. Can I, can I just give some feedback? Yeah, because for those of us on GCSE English, this could be brilliant for you know our language analysis. So things like meta working on metaphor, putting in different metaphors, and then being able to see very clearly um, the effects of language and how one metaphor might fit that sentence yes. and context, but doesn't fit another. So that could be a really clever you know a way to replicate this resource. But on language analysis, so thank you. No, thank you. I shall steal it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the case study, so the member of staff that used the word board, um, the case study that they put forward for this project is um, one of the learners that comes from Eritrea. All learners that come to study ESOL at Samuel College complete an initial assessment. And there's a reading, writing, speaking and listening aspect to it. This was the learners writing um, when they first came to college in September. And as you can see there, the learners attempted to write two sentences. And the first sentence, they've got correct, my name is. And the second sentence says, I come Eritrea. Week one, the learner wrote five sentences, and as you can see, there's some spelling errors there. Week three, when the word board was introduced, the learners wrote seven sentences and the spelling mistake is Sandra. Week five, got to 11 sentences and there's one error just on number 10 and it's teacher. Week seven, 
got to 12 sentences. And the sentence at the bottom and sentence 12, there's three spelling errors there. Week nine, which was the end of the project, the learner got to 15 sentences. And there's three spelling errors on the page. As I said with the word board, each week a new sentence was added on. And learners who were not at the stage to complete 15 sentences were still able to practice the sentences. So a learner who may have been of a lower ability may have only had the first seven sentences. And those were the sentences that they would practice. But they still had the rest of the sentences there to further if they wanted to stretch themselves or, or develop their spellings. And with the word board as well, it was up to the learner which word they covered to practice. So they had a card which would cover words individually, or they had a longer card which would cover the whole sentence. So if a learner wanted to practice the whole sentence, they could do that. So our findings. The learner feedback was really positive. They absolutely loved being part of the project. A lot of the members of staff, we have um, one hour and 15 minute sessions, and the members of staff dedicated one, um, one hour and 15 minute session to spellings and learners using the spelling strategy in the classroom. On those days, learners, where, when they come in on the other days and they have a starter activity and they're waiting for the starter activity uh, before the lesson starts, they would actually come in have their word boards, have their spellings, and they'd be there practicing their spelling straight away. And they knew that when I spoke to these learners, oh, Wednesday is spellings day. And they looked forward to that day. When, what we, the project also found is when the word and spellings were relevant or personalized to learners, learners made more progress. So an example I have here is a member, the member of staff that was using the cut up letters to spell the months. Learners made some progress, but they didn't make the progress that the member of staff thought they would make. Whereas with the months, say September, they start college in September, they're not going to spell that month again until the following September, or if their birthday's in September, or if they read something with September in it. So when the member of staff moved the project onto the year address, the learner on week one could only write their postcode. By the second week, they were able to write their address in the correct format and got more, apart from Smedic and Birmingham, that's a lot of progress made in a week. And when this member of staff did, this, did the project, learners had to come to a table and find their address because it was their address and they were already familiar with it, they saw it straight away and she was shocked at how quickly they found their own address and were able to identify it. The unexpected outcome was the member, that, member of staff that used the word board was able to identify two learners in the group that had potential learning difficulties. With ESO, learning difficulties are not identified until you're about entry three, level one. And she could see from the pattern that learners, the pattern of letters that learners were using in their spellings, it kind of indicated to the, the member of staff that possibly these learners could have dyslexia. So in the pre-entry classes at Samuel College, there's always a learning support assistant in the class. So that member of staff was able to direct that support to the learning support assistant to be able to support those students in class as well. Learners improve their handwriting, their pronunciation of words, their recall, their um, formation of letters as part of practicing their spellings, which then helped their handwriting. One of the biggest um, outcomes that staff saw was the actual handwriting that improved. And the word board approach reinforced the importance of repetition in language learning, and especially at the lower levels. And from feedback from the other members of staff who are part of the project, they all want to use the word board method to, practice, to enable learners to practice their spellings and also practice their sentences. And I myself, want to use that with my ESL learners next year and how I've highlighted the word in the sentence I would highlight a word and I don't think I would give the um, ESL learners a standalone spelling again I'd rather give them a sentence so they've got that context for that word thank you very much thank you I'm now going to pass on to Kirsty Um, my name is Kirsty, I'm 
name's Kersey, um, and the one from the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm an English teacher at Moulton College in Northamptonshire, and I led our part of the um, the project there. Um, if it's okay, I would like to start with a little activity, hopefully 30 seconds. <coughs> Can I please just have a show of hands for anybody who is currently a GCSE English teacher in here? Oh good, we've got at least one on each table, that's great. Please could I just ask, um, hopefully there's two felt tip type pens, sharpies or something else that I brought from home on the table and some white A4 paper. Please could I just ask um, one or two GCSE English teachers per table to just write, hopefully as big as you can manage, something that your GCSE English learners struggle to do successfully when answering a language analysis question, please, and then just hold it up for me. Just the first thing that comes to mind that they either do wrong or struggle to do at all um, that you notice in their work for a language analysis question. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much. So, hopefully, um, what that's illustrated to me is quite reassuring um, because they are the same things that I notice in my learners as a GCSE English teacher. So, um, be it them being able to stay focused on what the question's asking, give um, explanations um, to go with their quotes, or actually ensure that they're explaining something relevant to the quote they've just used, um, and yeah, draw in plausible inferences from the evidence or the quotes that they're actually using. So, um, thank you for that. Hopefully, yeah. So, um, basically, those are these reasons that are these kind of struggles that you've all just um, given were the things that actually inspired our project. Really, the fact that um, although all of our learners are, of course, unique. Um, students who are resitting the GCSE English often have a lot of things in common in terms of when they're answering questions where there's a very um, where there's a very clear success criteria, sort of where we would know what we want them to do, but we often see them all making similar mistakes to one another. Um, so, basically, what we wanted to do for our project was design a scaffold to try and help with that. We actually find um, or found that. Lots of our students obviously come from different schools to one another, almost always, have had different experiences with their, um, in their English lessons and have been taught to analyse language in very different ways, often using um, lots and lots of different scaffolds from PISA to PETL to all sorts. There are so many. The old... Um, the age-old scaffold that we've probably all heard of is Point Evidence Explained, the, the P um, scaffold, that actually is still, I think, quite commonly used um, by teachers. Um, and actually, for recent learners, we were finding that that scaffold was particularly unhelpful, and learners really didn't do well starting a paragraph with a point because they didn't know how to make a point or didn't really know what making a point meant. And they especially struggled with just um, how vague the explain thing was. And actually, therefore, a scaffold like point evidence explain really wasn't useful for our learners. So we were looking to um, do something a bit different and look at how we could make a meaningful, useful scaffold which would tackle um, the common struggles, really. So that was what our project was about. Um, so I have brought in some of those scaffolds, that, um, some of the scaffolds we used. We actually designed a scaffold for GCSE English. Um, well, we designed two, but I've only bought the most popular successful one, because there's no point showing the one, the one that wasn't very successful. And we also designed scaffolds for two of our vocational areas, so sport and animal welfare lessons, based on some of the same principles. So looking at the common struggles, looking at the questions that animal um, welfare lecturers and sport lecturers were seeing students struggle, um, where they were seeing the students struggle with their writing. Um, we worked together to design some scaffolds to help based on what the students could do and actually put in the, the easiest thing first. So if I could please ask you now to open the mysterious bright pink envelope um, on your table. And then hopefully there should be at least one between three-ish so that you can all see one. Could you please for now just focus not on the bright rainbow coloured one, but on the one that says evidence and zoom at the bottom. It starts with steps to take when answering an analysis question. Hopefully you can all manage to have sight of that. Sorry, there's a particularly big table there, won't mind me, but if you could just pass it round, you'll only hopefully need a kind of 20 second, 30 second glance at that. 
So not the bright red. Do you Easy, like you call it. Yeah, easy. Yeah, easy. It says easy. Yeah, I do. Easy. Yeah, the easy one. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is the one I wanted to focus on first because obviously I'm a GCSE English teacher and therefore this is the one that has been most successful and is the one that I am using. And um, the brightly coloured one I'll show you in a minute, but that's a sport one. That's why I don't want to talk about that yet. So um, actually, what we did here was thought about right, what do the, what can the students do? What can our students do? Which is mostly, although they obviously need some support and help and training with this as well, they can find quotes that are relevant to the answer the question. They can actually find the best evidence that will support. Most students can do that. So why not put that first in a paragraph? It might make us wince a little bit as English teachers because I know style-wise it's not great and it can possibly seem maybe a little bit cringy to do that, but actually why let them continue to attempt to use a scaffold, maybe a pre-learned scaffold from school that they've never actually been able to do successfully, that they've constantly struggled with and never actually mastered any stages of a scaffold like Kettle or Pisa? Why continue to work with that if they can't and if they can't master the stages? So this scaffold really, um, what we did was tell them to put a quote first and actually put in brackets to limit that quote so that they're not copying a whole paragraph. If they were tempted to copy a whole paragraph as their quote, we'd encourage them to look at the key points and break that into three or four quotes instead, if that paragraph's got the most useful stuff. Um, then the, the bit that lots of people said when I asked you a minute ago about your learners' common struggles um, was the explain. And actually, the zoom on this um, scaffold here um, we have found really, really helps reset English learners um, to explain um, the quote, to actually stay focused on the question and um, yeah, to, to analyse language. And actually, we're quite lucky that the exam board that we use as well really do accept um, that a good answer will be one that just comments on the effect of words and phrases. No need to involve language features, language techniques, unless they're able to, unless it's actually relevant. And actually, half the time, if our students were identifying language features, that was where it stopped. They could find one, but it just became a spotting exercise. If they're not commenting on the effect of language, they wouldn't get any marks anyway. Um, it's EDUCAS. EDUCAS. Yeah, EDUCAS, yeah. Can I just come in to see, EQE have said on their training um, that using technical words and language analysis enhances a student's response, but it's not always necessary because they award the mark to the exam the explanation. Cool. So actually, hopefully then, all the examples hopefully are working towards that increasingly and making it far more accessible. They're not, they're not there yet, though. No, and I have to say, I haven't. Yeah. They are not there yet. I can say categorically, EDUCAS definitely never ever care or want you to identify a language feature. You won't lose marks for it, but you can achieve the top marks simpler by commenting on the effect of words and phrases. Hence why I would always obviously urge caution, and every English teacher will know you have to look whether we want to or not, you do have to look at the requirements of the exam board and that. So um, I'm not saying, obviously it's only a suggested scaffold. Um, so, yeah, we, what did we find? We found that the fastest improvements did happen with this scaffold. Students loved it. They said that this made sense. They knew what to do at each stage. And actually, we just saw their writing improving because of it. Did we use the scaffold for all of our learners? No, definitely not. If students were already working at a higher ability with their language analysis, than this, of course this would have hindered them and actually restricted them, so we didn't and therefore with those learners, you obviously know who those learners are in the room, and you stretch them at an appropriate level to them and actually you never want a scaffold to stifle somebody, so um, we didn't use it for everybody, only those learners that we were seeing struggle with the things that you all highlighted at the beginning. Um, so really we thought that actually this scaffold was successful because we all need to walk before we can run and actually all too often I think we assume that all of our learners in the room can do certain things that they can't and to ignore that and to not acknowledge it is never particularly helpful. Um, sorry, I'm completely forgetting which slide I'm supposed to be on, I think this is my last slide. Um, yeah, so the impact really was that they liked the more formulaic scaffold. Our scaffolds in sport and animal welfare were based on the same principles. So I worked very closely with the sport and animal welfare lecturers 
And I know Claire spoke earlier about surprises and what shocked and surprised me, um, but not in a bad way, was actually that the animal welfare and sport lecturers struggled to know what would make an effective <laughs> scaffold. And actually some of them hadn't really thought of the concept of using scaffolding in the vocational areas. So even though they knew straight away which questions learners were losing marks on because of the way they were writing their answer and because of the way they couldn't, they, they were very, very good verbally and they had all the knowledge but couldn't put that down onto paper. Um, they knew that, they knew which questions, but they really, really appreciated the help with me working through with them. Okay, what can they do and how can we um, create a scaffold based on almost like a perfect end response, a perfect modelled answer, work backwards and put it in language that they understand and make it into a useful scaffold for those learners. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it. So in terms of individual differences we saw, I mentioned already that we didn't use the scaffold if it was going to bring students backwards. If they're already at a higher level, they of course don't need a scaffold or they need maybe a more advanced scaffold just to tackle the bit that they're struggling with. Um, we did find that students who are particularly weak in maths, so students who are resit in functional skills maths, maybe even at entry level three or level one, didn't cope very well with the scaffold just on paper. They did appreciate a verbal explanation, probably like quite a lot of students would, but actually especially those students who studied with um, who struggled with maths, we translated the, this scaffold for them and it wasn't that they didn't need it but we maybe needed to say quote and comment and then when they've mastered that work more on the comment element and help them to work to figure out the zoom and how that worked. So sometimes we needed, they needed more verbal support there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the vocational tutors have been especially grateful and have been far more engaged with this than prior um, CPD about embedding that they saw as a sort of forced tick box. They liked this because it came from um, a position of trying to tackle their struggles within their own subject and it just so happens that it also ticks the English box but actually that wasn't the reason. We were helping them to scaffold because their students were losing marks because of that mismatch in their verbal and written ability on those questions. Yes. Right, um, can I ask you a question because I've kind of done this it's kind of almost subconscious thing yeah, that I've yeah. over the last 10 or 12 months uh, without actually setting up something like that for students. The question that I've got, and this is what I've come across doing the same sort of thing, I've kind of stuck to point evidence, explain, link. Okay? Yeah. Um, and I've moved them towards a similar thing to you would say, pick quite a long quote, not too long, like you say on there, no more than 10 words. Yeah. And then once you've talked about the quote, you want to try and pick out a keyword, which is your Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I've found is, like, the, the, the example you've got there, so, a back in wind brought organic scat. Yeah. I found a lot of them would pick out wind instead of the bit that I think they should zoom in on. Yeah. Did you come across that? And if you did, how did you try and overcome it? Because that's the bit that i found to be a stumbling block. I've still got to hold their hand to find the actual bit, so they'll ignore like a word like sinister yeah. and pick like blue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I so agree. What the most comfortable word, like a word like sinister, is so. They might not understand yeah. the word. So that's why yeah. the goal. What well, I know when you do that then is they, they, they can't then expand anything. Yeah. Like so I've, yeah. I've, what I'm talking about is did you come across a strategy to try and point them towards finding? Um, I know you're trying to get them to explain the one that they can explain. I, I get that's fair enough, but. So yeah. Definitely same struggles and definitely I've seen it. And the other weird one is when they actually just explain what the word means rather than using it to yeah. answer the question. Yeah. That's the other one. It's, so um, I did a specific lesson on Zoom and how to pick the keyword. And the only things I've said are um, choose quotes that you actually understand and then understand every word in because otherwise you're not going to be able to comment effectively. So even if it was a good quote, if you don't understand it, we can work on that in class and that's what we want to do. But in an exam, don't choose it because you're, never, you're not going to be successful if you don't understand it. And secondly, um, yeah, just working through, okay, what could you say about it? Because ultimately, if they choose what we would class as the wrong Zoom word, as long as they still comment on it effectively and answer the question, I'm quite happy. And even if it wasn't necessarily the one we'd have picked, maybe in their next quote it will be. So I try and go quite gently on that, but I don't ignore it and I do try and steer them towards. I always think 
which word in there is going to help you to answer that question most successfully. And if it's paper one, which for anyone who doesn't know is sort of like the fiction, analysing fiction, analysing creative text, I would say, which word in there helps you to picture that better? That's what I go with, but other, I can absolutely amplify the same struggles. I have no magic one. Yes. Uh, it's just to say that you could have a synergy between your two projects to tackle the issue, which is to use this, where you choose, get the learners, gap the model heed, gap the quotes, the breakdown of the quotes, and then get the learners to match in what, what you would perceive to be the correct image that you were hoping that they would. Yeah. Um, and that might be a really good synergy of the two projects. Yeah, sort of like a particular yeah. like a game on the Zoom word, and yeah. actually questioning each other so sometimes I do t turn that into like a Q&A activity as in some, I saw someone else in the room chose a different word why did you choose that one why did you choose that one getting them to verbally justify um, but yeah sorry I'll probably that's not because I think I'm going over just quickly sorry <laughs> sorry can I oh. <laughs> that's okay I'll you, you okay you thank you. <laughs> sorry thank you very much and um, I'll <laughs> Right, whistle stop talk. Uh, <laughs> takes his jacket off, sweating profusely. Uh, so one wanted to, to pick up on what Kirsty was saying about that dialogue between contextualizing and, contextualizing and embedding, and the fact that it don't work unless you go about it in a meaningful way. So what we wanted to do was look at in UCB working with our sports team about actually developing a methodology, not just a strategy, but a pedagogy for making contextualising of learning within English vocationally relevant and appropriate and meaningful and embedding those skills within vocational delivery. In most institutions I'm aware of, there are lots of strategies, very few of these go much further than let's do our CPD on getting the English bit in, great, we'll revisit that in another year. So what we did is we set up a collaborative project with our sports team, we were knocking at an open door, we've got great relationships with them because obviously I'm very sporting, not. Um, we conducted a bespoke skills baseline. We really went away and thought about how do we work out what skills our learners need to develop, again relating to what Kirsty was saying. It's about identifying the skills and finding out a strategy in the classroom, not just as English teachers but as vocational lecturers as well. We use that to create a skills profile, okay, like an ILP, and I'll show you an example of that. And we worked with the sports team so that the English skills development, or I would think of it as literacy skills development, was taking part in the sports lessons as well as in the English lesson, rather than we've all been in those observations where here comes the English bit. Um, <laughs> So, that's what the skills tracker looks like, apologies it's very small, but we, we basically unpicked what are the literacy skills that you need, yes for GCSE, but to function with a sports literacy. I'm kind of interested in vocational literacies, and so we would work out for each learner, it's these skills that the learner has a quote-unquote deficit in, I'm not interested in getting them to sit a mock test at the beginning of the year, that just tells me that they didn't pass last year. It doesn't actually tell me what skills, because GCSE, whichever exam board that you're looking at, it's not like maths where here's the algebra question. The skills that are being um, tested are interleaved in most questions to a greater or a lesser extent, and it's about unpicking those. So, what we did is make sure that in the sports uh, sessions and in English sessions, very clearly, the skills and the hierarchy of skills, okay, it's a bit of an old-fashioned ragged way of doing this, were very explicit, and that in the sports lesson, as well as the English lesson, we were using the same AFL tool to assess their skills development. Because what students want to know is, where am I on the spectrum of that skill? How do I move on with that skill? Generally speaking, most students who are recent in GCSE know that I'm no good at the 10 mark question. Well, that's totally irrelevant. It's about unpicking the skills. And we found that once we'd unpicked the skills for each learner and then used the tracker to convey this information to the sports lecturers, you suddenly have what is quite common sense, which is an individualized approach. We both work with that student in different contexts. We need to develop that skill with that student. Well, how are we going to do that? That's when 
you, you start having the CPD element of this skill is developed using this strategy. Most staff in my institution have done dance training and every year I turn up in every team meeting and go, here's how you develop literacy skills, and every year I come back and go, so what have we done? And nothing. This has been much more effective. The spirit of collaboration has been quite meaningful. Even in the best of institutions, collaboration often falls by the wayside. This was meaningful because we had a project approach and we had a deadline, ah, and we also had a kind of a real, real clear rationale uh, of what we wanted to do. The sharing of specific data, this student needs to work on those skills, is so obvious, and yet getting achieving that was a massive uh, two minutes, okay, uh, it was a massive hurdle. So by being able to say it's this student needs to work on this there was an increased awareness of individuals' literacy needs. No more going into a lesson, here's the reading bit, here's the spelling bit. It was a, a bit more of an ingrained approach. We noticed a greater shared ownership in the development of skills. It was no longer, oh, that's an English problem, that's a sports problem. There was a greater degree of sharing of skills development. The concept of bridging the gap and an end to this tokenism. Um, and we, I, I think I've moved the teams away from talking about strategy. What's our strategy? Well, strategy doesn't really mean anything if you're not rooting it in, in pedagogic approaches. Um, as I say, we've been working with some external consultants doing deep dives. And um, I put this report straight under their nose. Um, and once they got over the big words, they were able to see that this was quite a valuable activity. And as I was saying to Claire earlier, this is the starting point. This is how we think we can actually develop students' skills across their programme of study. So to give you, I'm sorry about the words here, but you know, cut and paste and all that. In terms of progress of the students, uh, in terms of being able to skim and scan and find specific information, we saw massive increases. One student from 45% in terms of their, their achievement in terms of skim and scan questions, uh, they went up to 73% because they were using the skills explicitly in every lesson they had on their programme of study. Um, what came out as a surprise? Students really hated it when their English lecture was trying to contextualise. What do you know about throwing and catching? Nothing. But they loved it when their vocational lecturer was embedding it. They, they really got a kick out of that because they could see that the use of that skill was yielding positive results in their vocational course and they could make the link. But it was interesting, they were interested in embedding, not contextualisation, which was strange because um, I was expecting the opposite, so it was really interesting. Students really enjoyed the kind of teams working together and being part of this. Um, break. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any time for some Q and A or yeah, two, two minutes? Two minutes. Yeah. One good question. Yeah. So, in what um, in what manner was this ILP shared? Was that a working document? Was it loaded somewhere? We've got a centralised system, not not like a VLE, but a centralised system where you can see all students' uh, comments, progress, courses. The institution has, has developed that themselves. But frankly, you could print it, print it off and hand it to someone and say, oh, yeah, that's it. Um, but the actual creating of a bespoke baseline, which we, we need to do a lot of work on, was the key. It was absolutely the key. And then sharing that with other people. Simple things we've been trying to do for 20 years, and the project gave us a, a mechanism to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.